Hi, welcome to the Let's Talk Exascale podcast from the U.S. Department of Energy's Exascale Computing Project. I'm your host, Scott Gibson. I'm joined in this episode by Jack Dongera, a computing pioneer. He is an R&D staff member in the Computer Science and Mathematics Division at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I will touch upon some highlights of his exceptional career. Jack was recently elected to the National Academy of Sciences, or NAS, for his distinguished and continuing achievement in original research. In 2022, he received the AM Turing Award from the Association for Computing Machinery. That honor recognized his innovative contributions to numerical algorithms and libraries that enabled high-performance computational software to keep pace with exceptional hardware improvements for over four decades. Jack is Professor Emeritus at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where he recently retired as founding director of UT's Innovative Computing Laboratory, or ICL, an ECP collaborator. Along with his roles at ORNL and UT, he has served as a Turing Fellow at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom since 2007. He earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Chicago State University, a master's in computer science from the Illinois Institute of Technology, and a doctorate in applied mathematics from the University of New Mexico. Jack is a fellow of the ACM, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the International Supercomputing Conference, and the International Engineering and Technology Institute. Additionally, he has garnered multiple honors from those organizations. He is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a foreign member of the British Royal Society. So first of all, thanks for joining me, Jack. Thanks for being on the program. The uh, end of the Exascale Computing Project is in sight with the technical work wrapping up in December of this year. So this has been quite a journey. ECP teams have developed a software ecosystem for Exascale. They've provided scientists with versatile tools. Will you share your perspective on how the project has progressed over its lifetime? And mm -hmm. please what you've observed from the vantage point afforded by the participation of the Innovative Computing Laboratory at the University of Tennessee. Sure, let me uh, first, thanks for, for the, having the opportunity to be on the, on the show here. Um, let me just say that uh, the end of Exascale is, is really both a success and a huge risk. Uh, you know, the project has delivered, you know, great capabilities to, um, to the Department of Energy, both in terms of uh, human and technical uh, accomplishments. Uh, but uh, now, however, the DOE is highly vulnerable in some sense uh, to losing the knowledge and skill of this uh, trained uh, staff uh, as uh, future funding is uh, unclear. So ECP is ending and there's no follow-on project, uh, no follow-on to allow uh, roughly a thousand people have been engaged in ECP and it's really been a terrific project from the standpoint of getting together with uh, application people, uh, people designing algorithms and software people working together on this common uh, vision of, uh, of working towards uh, Exascale and hardware, hardware vendors have been involved in that uh, as well. Um, so today um, uh, without funding, those 1000 people are really um, uh, uncertain and uncertain about their future. And that uncertainty generates great anxiety uh, among lab staff. When I talk to people at the labs, I, I sense that anxiety, uh, in particular junior researchers who really um, uh, have started almost their career based on this project, which has been going seven years. And um, we don't have a follow-on project at the scale uh, that would uh, be able to uh, use their talents. So, uh, you know, in some sense, um, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've not really uh, accomplished uh, the end of this project in a very satisfying way. The project is ending. We've delivered exascale machines. We have applications running at, on at least one of those machines today and showing very impressive uh, results. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the follow-on isn't there. In 2022, um, uh, the DOE... Uh, under the Advanced uh, Scientific Computer uh, Organization, uh, set a, put together a set of workshops that were supposed to address uh, AI for science, energy, and security. Um, 
And, um, you know, those were well attended, reports were written um, that discussed the, the uh, challenges and how to overcome some of them. Um, and then uh, I guess what happened next was uh, COVID happened. So the pandemic happened, that slowed everything down and uh, things really didn't uh, get as much traction as they probably should have. And um, uh, in some sense, uh, we haven't recovered from that. There's great effort going on behind the scenes, I think. Uh, many colleagues are trying to work uh, with uh, DOE and uh, Congress to put together a plan. I know Rick Stevens is uh, to put together a plan for AI, uh, for science, energy, and security. But you know that's something that's going to take time uh, before funds can be uh, appropriated and the program actually put together. So the unfortunate part is uh, uh, the Exascale computing program is about to end and um, there's no, uh, no follow-on project at the scale that would uh, be able to engage, uh, engage those people. So that, that's really the, uh, uh, the crisis, I would say. There's, there's like, I think there are 800 people at the labs, another 200 people at universities who have been uh, devoted to putting together uh, the uh, ECP program. And uh, that's, about to, uh, that's about to end with, uh, I guess we have what, about six, six months left in the program before that uh, thing hits the wall. And uh, with the uncertainty there uh, and with many other opportunities for people with the talents uh, that uh, the Exascale computing program uh, put together, I'm sure they would find jobs in other, other areas, unfortunately find jobs in other, other areas. Uh, you know, the cloud vendors are seeking uh, this just this kind of talent, I think, to move them to move them forward. So I, you know, it's been a great uh, great success. On on one hand, uh, it's uh, been very challenging. We always like challenging problems. Uh, I think we've uh, we've come and put in place uh, uh, solutions for many of the issues that we had, and uh, we see you know great uh, promise for the future in terms of using those exascale machines and the applications. Uh, the unfortunate part is that we don't have a way to retain the talent, uh, the cadre of si scientists who are well-educated and well-trained, um, uh, who, can, who can continue on with, uh, with the program itself. You've said that pursuing exascale computing capability is all about pushing back the boundaries of science to understand things that we could not before. In what ways do you believe ECP has put the right sophisticated tools in place to reach that objective? Well, one of the nice things about working on this project is that um, uh, the funding, adequate funding was there to develop uh, applications and software. So we could always use more, but we, it, in this case here, there, there, was, there, was a, there was a substantial amount of funding put in place to target um, you know, 21 applications. The whole point of the ECP project is about uh, the science. And those 21 applications were, um, were identified uh, and uh, they're all energy related, you know, wind energy, uh, dealing with uh, carbon capture, dealing with uh, nuclear energy, uh, 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 proton science, chemistry, uh, QCD, astrophysics, and you know, the list goes on. And those 21 applications are the things that uh, those exascale computers were put in place to help uh, to help uh, meet the challenges of those applications and push back uh, the boundaries of of those uh, of science in some sense for those applications. So part of the money went for the applications. Another sizable amount of money went for uh, the algorithms and software. So the software stack for ECP has I think 84 projects in it, and they cover you know a whole range of things. Uh, from some core uh, things that are needed to, to run on uh, those exascale machines, to compiler support, to, um, uh, to tools and uh, technologies, to uh, developing this uh, software development stack uh, that, that's been put in place, uh, dealing with the, the many of the major uh, components that are used in those applications, visualization, uh, being able to uh, minimize uh, communication, uh, doing checkpoints, and uh, providing for a larger ecosystem for Exascale. So those 84 projects um, uh, you know, are, are being worked on. Uh, they're coming to conclusion. 
Uh, they're being worked on at the uh, labs and the universities, uh, trying to, again, uh, meet the challenge of developing components that will run at a reasonable rate at scale on those exascale machines. And, you know, it's been really a, a pleasure working with uh, colleagues in different areas, helping to put together uh, those tools. You know, from my group in Tennessee, we're working on six uh, components uh, of that software stack. We're working on a numerical library for linear algebra called Slate. We're working on a numerical uh, set of routines that'll work for GPUs called Magma. We're working on some iterative solvers in a project called Ginkgo. We're working on some performance tools called Pappy. We're working on some uh, the development of some programming aids that will help effectively use the large amount of parallel processing that we have called Parsec. And we're working, we've been working on uh, open MPI for a long time, providing the basic fabric under which all of these uh, applications and software uh, will run on those exascale machines. So it's been an engaging project for the last uh, seven years almost now. It's uh, been a project that I think has uh, developed many uh, very worthwhile components. It's been very rewarding from the standpoint of the um, uh, application scientists and the software developers having uh, adequate resources to really invest in that, and then seeing those tools be used or picked up in applications and uh, driving those applications uh, to getting much higher levels of performance than we had in the previous generation of machines. So it's been a very engaging project. Uh, it's uh, almost uh, something that I would consider a highlight. You know, in my career, working with the uh, DOE, putting together software, uh, putting them uh, in, in place so that the applications can effectively uh, use them. That's saying a lot, a highlight from your career. Has the Department of Energy ever done anything like ECP before? To my knowledge, they haven't. Yeah, this is really something uh, a first in some sense. They've done things, of course, at, at a lower, uh, smaller level, but this is the first uh, at such a broad level. Basically, uh, you know, the whole ECI project, the Exascale Computing Initiative, you know, was to develop uh, these three exascale machines and then put in place uh, the applications, the app, the um, algorithms, and the software. So the ECP part of that is the is the 1.8 billion dollars that was devoted to those to those areas. Uh, the whole project ECI was about four billion dollars over the seven years, and that engaged uh, and and that was purchasing the hardware or uh, putting in place the hardware that can be. Uh, used to uh, to solve those very challenging science projects. So this is the first time that I've uh, in my career where I've uh, been engaged in a project which had you know a thousand people working on it for that uh, for that one goal of developing uh, tools and applications uh, for uh, for those uh, for those science problems, putting in place the hardware that can effectively deal with it, and putting in place a whole stack software stack. Uh, that can be used across those applications. So it really is a great, uh, a great project. It was a great project. It is a great project. There's many accomplishments, and the unfortunate part is there's nothing to follow on. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned science being the focus of this work. That's what it's all about. With respect to what you just said, is there more you could say about the uniqueness of ECP in terms of the magnitude of its accomplishments in the importance to science? Well, again, you know, this is uh, getting a thousand people on the same page, working with a common goal of developing those applications and uh, putting in place the infrastructure that's needed to have those things run on these, you know, very sophisticated uh, set of uh, hardware uh, that that's being deployed is really a uh, a great uh, a great uh, vision to uh, to watch. You know, going to an annual meeting for ECP is really uh, another engaging thing. So here we have a room full of people, you know, four or five, 600 people in a room. Uh, we're talking about the applications, the hardware, uh, the software, uh, the issues involved in getting everything to work uh, correctly uh, is, uh, was really a, a very energizing experience uh, for, for myself and for the team at uh, Tennessee who are working on these uh, various software components. So it's something that I, I would say, you know, we haven't experienced uh, from the standpoint of developing high-performance computing technologies 
uh, uh, we haven't experienced something like this in, in, before at this level. Jack, what sorts of initiatives or actions will help carry ECP's legacy into the future properly? We've talked a lot about that aspect, the need to, to do that. Do you have ideas or suggestions? Well, you know, I think um, uh, the, the project that was supposed to be the follow on, and that's AI for science, energy and security. I think that's that has the potential uh, to be at the right level uh, to make the uh, considerable impact in terms of science problems and uh, drive a lot of the technology that we've put in place uh, forward. Uh, uh, and it's just a question of getting the right uh, level of uh, funding in place so that project can get initiated. So I think you know AI is gonna have a tremendous impact. It is already having an impact on science and, and going forward. We uh, see that as uh, really complementing how we do physics-based uh, simulation. Uh, it's gonna help us uh, in, in that way of complementing what, what, uh, what we've done in the, the more traditional ways of doing it. It's going to provide us with uh, more effective, uh, uh, better uh, solutions in, in, a, in a shorter time. And, um, you know, we see the uh, fruits of that already uh, being, uh, being reported. And uh, I see that really as, as really the next uh, major phase uh, in terms of how we address um, uh, these uh, major challenges for advanced uh, advanced computing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, AI and machine learning, neural networks, and all those sorts of things have really permeated the field in, in a big way. Are there other aspects of ECP or Exascale in general that uh, you feel like we should discuss that we'd be remiss in not mentioning? Well, uh, I guess, um, you know, the one thing we can say is that um, uh, we should really, in the future, we should really engage in co-design. So we talk about co-design. Co-design is where we get the hardware people together with the application people, together with the algorithms people, along with the software people, and help design a hardware that can effectively meet some of the challenges that we have. So we talk about that, but we really haven't done it. We haven't done it in the ECP project. And I think moving forward, we're going to have a situation where business as usual will not really work going forward. So we really need to think about end-to-end -end co design, developing hardware that can effectively match the kinds of problems that we have today. When we take a look at the performance that we see on these uh, exascale machines, we're really capturing just a small percent of the theoretical peak performance. And that's in some sense because the, um, the way in which those machines were architected uh, using commodity processors, putting them together with commodity interconnects, and then using them to uh, to drive exascale was not really the most effective way. If we take a look at our uh, cloud providers, the hyperscaler guys, those guys are designing their own hardware. So they're designing hardware which is specific for the problems that they have. So they're not relying on commodity processors, they're designing hardware which will match their application needs. In the scientific area, we should be taking a step back and doing exactly that kind of thing. Look at what we can do designing hardware that matches in a better way uh, the applications that we're going to be dealing with in the next round, putting them together, put the hardware together in a way that we can see very effective use of that hardware going forward. And we won't have this uh, problem of uh, getting just a few percent return on, on our investment in, in that hardware. So I think end-to-end uh, -end, uh, uh, co-design is something that we need to do. We also need to be prototyping hardware and doing that at a scale that makes sense so that we can put together hardware and see if it's the kind of hardware that's required or necessary to help us in solving our application problems. I can remember a time uh, when we had many, many uh, exploratory hardware projects going on at universities and even at some labs that were looking and probing uh, the architecture space to see what would be the right match. And I think we need to go back and do some of that. Today we have you know, the ability to design chiplets uh, that could uh, be used to solve certain aspects of our application problems. We should be looking at that and trying to understand how we can effectively use that kind of technology in building the next high performance uh, machines. In terms of the, the social dynamics or 
ways of putting this sort of environment in place, what do you think could happen or should happen to create this sort of collaborative uh, co-design uh, situation that you were just describing? Well, you know, first we need to have uh, adequate funding to do that. So somehow we need to uh, orient things, uh, first get the mindset right that we need to invest in this kind of a program where uh, we're designing hardware to, to match the needs of the applications and not gonna rely on commodity off the shelf products. So today, you know, the model for building these exascale machines is, you know, we have a certain amount of money and we have a target performance and we're gonna build a machine that matches that target performance. And the unfortunate part is that uh, perhaps that performance measurement is in terms of the LINPAC benchmark. So we design a machine that can hit that LINPAC benchmark but when we look at how that machine would actually perform on many of the applications that we have, it's, it's far less than we see on that LINPAC benchmark. You know, LINPAC benchmark is really modeling a matrix multiply. And uh, many of our applications don't use matrix multiply as their core, uh, their core problem. So we need to design architectures that can really look at uh, the, the fundamentals that we have in our applications and try to uh, try to make that as efficient as possible. And experimenting with architectures, having things which uh, you know uh, try to relieve some of the pressure on memory. Data movement is one of the most expensive things that we do today. And designing machines that can effectively move data around or make uh, make the processor closer to where the data is, uh, perhaps would be one way of uh, accommodating for that. Uh, for that um, uh, deficiency that we have today. Great, fantastic. Anything else to add? I think that's it. Great. I'll get off my Jack soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for being on ECP's podcast. It was my pleasure and I look forward to doing it again in the future. Bye for now. Thank you, Jack.